Once again, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lorenzo Egot the Fourth, and I'm Maria Archel B. Hiboni. We are civil engineering students and an officer of the Collegiate Engineering Council, and together we will be your hosts for today. This event is in collaboration with the Panoy Basurero Corporation, Zero Waste Academy Philippines, and the Sustainable Energy and Enterprise Development for Communities, also known as seed for com We are truly grateful to have the opportunity to come together as we envision a sustainable future and aim to promote plastic and waste management to students through simple and creative innovations and projects. The U.S. Collegiate Engineering Council has invited six distinguished secrets to how waste management can be achieved. But before we dive into the highlights of this event, I'd like to give the floor to Engineer Philip Wong Marcon, our School of Engineering Community Extension Services Coordinator, for his opening remarks. Give you guys waiting any longer. We will now introduce our first speaker for today. Our first speaker for today is the scientific coordinator at Zero Waste Europe. He is also an environmental expert at the school. Of Gaia del Parco di Monza, R&D center based in Monza, North Italy, since 1990. His role there is to promote sustainable management of waste and resources. Today, we are honored to have him here as he delivers his talk about zero waste and reusables during the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome Mr. Enzo Favonio. Thank you so much for the invitation. I would like to share my screen uh, so as to share with you my slides, my presentation. Uh, tell me when you can see my my presentation. You can see it, sir. Sure. Is it on screen or right, ready for you? Yes, you can see your... That's great. Okay, so let's go. Uh, with no further ado, let's go uh, sharing my thoughts, my slides, my concepts with you. Um, well, basically, already the first slide, as you can see on your, on the left hand side, uh, includes whatever pertains to a zero waste approach, which is based uh, sometimes on community based actions uh, such as separate collection and recycling, as you can see at the bottom of the picture, with uh, the wheelie beans or the buckets in order to collect uh, the re dry recyclables, the organics, uh, whatever. And also it's partly based on individual behavior, uh, such as uh, packaging free purchases, uh, such as uh, zero waste uh, lifestyles, and so on and so forth. But they blend very well together. However, uh, this is an outline of my presentation. We have got a few questions to answer. Uh, first of all, what is the zero waste vision and practice? Because we have to set to establish a common ground of concepts uh, in which we consider what is doable, what is viable in a zero waste perspective. How does it work in communities? And is it working also in Asia, in the Philippines? Actually, the Philippines are one of the uh, international strongholds for uh, zero waste strategies and practices. And there are uh, very well performing schemes down there. I will go back to, there in a, uh, to that in a while. But also, and most importantly, the issue of the day, uh, is it doable? Is it practicable during a pandemic? Because once we discuss, for instance, uh, reuse, is reuse safe during COVID-19? Uh, this is something we will address during my presentation. So 
So first of all, what is zero waste and uh, how does it work? Well, basically, zero waste is a working method in order to keep the materials in their highest status for as long as possible. Uh, so we wanted to address uh, the global resource scarcity crisis. And uh, zero waste does not mean that nothing gets discarded. We have got waste, but we want to give it the maximum possible value through reuse, through recycling, through composting, through recycling, and so on and so forth. So it is a toolkit. It includes many tools to maximize preservation of our resources in the loop. And also it helps establishment of uh, livelihoods, emancipation of communities. I'm here to represent also Zero Waste Europe and our mission, we say, is to empower communities to rethink their relationship with the management of resources, thereby creating new jobs, creating new livelihoods, benefiting to the local economics uh, for the local communities, which is important in itself. Uh, this is, in a nutshell, the shift from the linear economy, take, make, waste. You extract the resources, you make them into products, and then you have to dispose of the final waste. Towards a recycling economy, in which you try to recycle as much as possible, but then still you have got some residual waste, and you want to dispose of that uh, some way. Well, in circular economy, which is the new paradigm, of course, as we know, globally, in order to address the global resource scarcity crisis, we want to keep the materials in the loop for as long as possible, minimizing the leakages of materials and resources from the loop. And this meets the zero waste cascading principle. Probably it's the key principle of zero waste approaches. Uh, with the zero waste cascading principle, we always aim for the highest and best use of resources. Then if plan A is not possible, we may go to plan B and then plan C and so on and so forth. We have got a zero waste hierarchy. We have got our own strategies also for the management of residual waste. We do not have time today to discuss it. But if you want me during questions and answers, I will be happy to address it. However, Let's consider how the uh, cascading principle applies to two key areas. I would consider that as priority areas. One is plastics, another one is organics. Organics are important because it's uh, the largest part of our municipal solid waste. So with organics, we say, first of all, consider feeding the humans. For instance, promote eating ugly vegetables or try to uh, some food recovery programs for uh, food stuff which is uh, about to expire, take them from the shelves and give it to charities to feed the humans. If that's not possible anymore, whatever the reason, consider feeding the animals. If neither feeding the humans nor feeding the animals is possible, consider feeding the soils. So adopt composting or anaerobic digestion and then you have got a compost or a digest state to be used as a soil improver. When it comes to plastics, first of all, let's consider durable plastics, reuse, may be supported by deposit refunding schemes. Then consider separating them and sending them to recycling if reuse is not possible. If neither works, you may consider downcycling. So turn them into a jumper, as the one I'm wearing today, or a bench, or floorings, or tiles, or eco-bricks, whatever. There will be a presentation on eco-bricks, by the way, I think I understand. However, we all like butterflies. This is, probably you know it, this is the butterfly diagram, whereby circular economy was codified at the global level. And you can see how many things we may do with the technical materials, maintaining, reusing, refurbishing, repairing, recycling, and with the biological materials, biorefineries, composting, anaerobic digestion, and so on and so forth. But the most important, let me draw your attention to the tail of the butterfly. Because in the tail of the butterfly, we have got what is not acceptable in a zero waste vision and in a circular economy program, which are the leakages of materials which have to be minimized. And leakages pertain to both landfilling and incineration. Incineration is not part of circular economy because it's destructive of resources, of course. So we have to avoid as much as possible incineration and destructive disposal. We have got four R's in uh, zero waste programs. Uh, I know what crosses your mind. You say, well, 
this only displays three R's because the fourth and most important R, I'm creating a little suspense uh, in order to draw your attention to the most important R. Of course, the three first R's are well known to everybody in the audience, reuse, reuse, recycle. And that's it, the cascading principle, reduce, reuse, recycle. But then, when we have got residual waste in zero waste programs, we always have to consider rethinking and redesigning. So probably the most important piece in zero waste programs pertains to residual waste. We are zero wasters, but we are so much in love with the residual waste because the residual waste is an incredible inventory of information. It tells us what's the mistake in the current system of producing goods, supplying them, using them. So we have to redesign what is not recyclable or reusable today to make it reusable or recyclable tomorrow. That's the most important. And this is the way it applies in communities. We have got our communities, our cities, our barangays, as you see in the Philippines, our cities, our villages, whatever. We have to do separate collection. We have got the recyclables going to recycling. We have got the organics going to composting. And so we tend to maximize recycling and composting. Then we have got residual waste. And residual waste has to be assessed. You can see it on your right hand side. It has to be addressed through the waste audits in order to feed into redesigning industrial redesigning so what is not recyclable or compostable today has to be made recyclable reusable or compostable for tomorrow banks for the materials which are hard to reuse or recycle extended producer responsibility in order to push the industry to redesign and alter new business models for instance product as a service i'm not selling you a good but i'm renting it to you then I take it back, for instance, a barrel, a reusable cup, whatever, reusable uh, tableware, and I take it back, I wash it, I sanitize it, I uh, uh, repair it if need be, uh, and then I will make it available for further uses. So this is the way the total zero waste concept works. Uh, of course, uh, you need roadmaps. We all need roadmaps whenever we have to go a new way. And zero waste is a comparatively brand new way. Uh, but we have got zero waste master plans. So we get you covered. Uh, for instance, there is a great zero waste master plan which was issued by Gaia Asia Pacific. And it includes all the instructions to decision makers, to individuals, to community leaders in order to implement zero waste programs. We have got a specific one in Europe. We were the first one to produce a zero waste master plan for our zero waste communities and cities. So you may download them free of charge. So we get you covered and feel served in that respect. Uh, is it working in Asia? Yes, I told you the Philippines are a important a strong goal for zero waste programs uh, at international level. Probably you know about San Fernando, but if you don't, I'm here to report about San Fernando. San Fernando is not a small village. It totals 300,000 people. And uh, nobody thought it was feasible, but they implemented a zero waste program and they went up to 80% and more separate collection. A minimization of residual waste in kilograms per inhabitant in Gia, and above all, savings, economic savings, which is a direct benefit to communities, but above all, the money they spend on waste management now is rewarding more people and less technology, less trucks, less incinerators, less landfills, and more uh, recycling, uh, collection, uh, curbside collection, uh, local uh, collectors, and so on and so forth, and reuse centers, and so on. There are other outstanding examples, others uh, still in the Philippines, such as Tacloban or Pune in India, Penang, uh, Bandung, sorry, in Indonesia, and so on and so forth. So you have got a wide ranging set of examples uh, to pick from. Okay, now, uh, as I already told you, we have got the two priority areas. One is organics, because organics are the largest contributor to uh, recycling rates. Without covering, uh, without addressing the organics, there is no way to implement a zero waste programs. First of all, because of their quantitative contribution to recycling rates. But also, from an operational standpoint, uh, uh, follow my uh, thoughts. Uh, 
if we get the organics out and if we minimize the percentage of organics inside residual waste, we can sharply reduce the collection frequency for residual waste because it will not be much patressable anymore. So first of all, this saves money because we are cutting all collection rounds. But also, it acts as a further driver for better separation of the dry recyclables as well, because people will find it easier to separate the dry recyclables than to put them in residual waste, which gets collected at a much lower frequency, of course. And another priority area is plastics. Plastics is becoming a global uh, nightmare, uh, but let alone in southern eastern Asia, in the Asia Pacific, well, you are a, an island country, a beautiful country. I'm a swimmer, and so I love islands. And you know how the shores have been totally spoiled by plastic pollution. We cannot afford it anymore. Also, you can see pictures, pictures by Chris Jordan, the uh, Midway Albatross uh, uh, dying from ingestion of uh, uh, barrel caps because they mistakenly think it is food and then they eat it and, and they get choked by it. Um, but uh, also there is a more hidden side of the plastic problem, which is a shipment of waste from the global north to the global south, faking it is for recycling, but then yeah, there is some informal recycling there, but most of it gets to dump sites and gets burned. Uh, emitting noxious gases or gets uh, dispersed by the wind into the countryside. And this is something we cannot afford anymore. Also, there is a more insidious side, which is microplastics. Uh, microplastics, because plastics we disperse into the environment, they tend to break down in time. They do not degrade, unfortunately. They do not ultimately biodegrade into carbon dioxide and water vapor, but they fragment into microplastics. And microplastics uh, target us and the animals. So they enter the human body through food, through the water we drink, through the air we breathe, and so on and so forth. And it was calculated that we are eating up to five grams of microplastics per person a week. It's like a credit card a week per person. Can we afford it? No, sure, sure we cannot. Uh, so uh, there is a global agenda in order to address plastics, and this of course, matches with the pandemic problem, uh, which we will address in a while. But first of all, facts and figures. Where is the plastic problem coming from? 80% of the plastics that are threatening the marine waters originated by inland sources. So, so it's not the ships throwing plastics into the sea, but it is plastics we use uh, inland and then gets into the rivers or by wind into beaches and then into the sea ultimately into our oceans. So it is on the mainland that we have to address the problem and win the fight against plastics. 10 million tons of plastics are ending up in oceans a year, and we cannot afford it. Recycling rate in the world, yes, I'm totally supportive to recycling. But plastic producers tell us, yes, let's keep using plastics because we can recycle them. But then if you uh, look at the bare numbers, only 15% of the plastics nowadays is getting recycled. The rest it gets into dump sites, incinerators, which is not good for the environment because it's like emitting fossil carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and this uh, adds on the climate change problem. Or it gets dispersed uh, directly into our rivers, our countrysides, our oceans, and so on and so forth. The main problem is that we are producing too much plastics because it's 400 million tons of plastics a year. Uh, and in a business as usual scenario, it has been calculated. I took part in a global survey. We published on science an article. I can give you the references if you are intrigued and you want to get more details. And we said, if we go on like this with the business as usual, the plastic production would double by 2040. So it will get up to 800 million tons. And plastic dispersion in oceans would get triple as today. 29 million tons. So by 2050, we will have more plastics than fish in the oceans. This is 
why we have to start closing the tap. This is where the strategies worldwide are heading towards. And a good area to start with is packaging. Of course, I'm not against plastics per se. We have got roughly 50% of the plastics which are durable plastics, such as the plastics in the same computer I'm speaking from, uh, to make it lighter, of course, or plastics used to make the car shapes or the motorbike shapes. Those are durable plastics and are not very much prone to getting dispersed into the countryside, into the rivers, into the oceans. But the problem is with single-use plastics, which are very, very lightweight, and they are very prone to getting dispersed. And the packaging plastics is the key area we have to act on. Um, so, for instance, if we consider it, the European Union was the first one to take action in this respect, uh, adopting a directive on single-use plastics, SUP, with bans on the hard to recycle plastics, which most often gets get found during the cleanups on beaches, in the rivers, in the sea, and so on and so forth. Straws, single-use tableware, dishes and cutlery, stirrers, the plastic sticks in order to steer your coffee or tea, whatever. The cotton buds, the balloon sticks. Uh, then it has got some product design requirements. For instance, connect the cap. The cap of the barrels has to be permanently connected to the barrel, not to get dispersed into the oceans. You may remember the albatross eating the caps. If it gets permanently connected, it won't get dispersed. A separate collection target at 90% for PT barrels and reduction targets for cups and food containers. So, as you can see, it includes also actions on separate collection and recycling. But above all, it starts working on reduction with bans on the hard to recycle plastics. Well, now the question is, and this is the issue of the day, is it affordable during a pandemic? Because now we are arm wrestling with this bad guy coronavirus. And of course, there is a narrative which is being built, according to which we need plastic to save the world. Is it true? Is it false? Let's take a look deeper at the issue. We have to move from knee-jerk reaction, sudden reactions, towards a more thoughtful approach. Because whenever humans have to face something which has got a sudden outbreak and we do not know because it's the first time ever we have to face it. We have got an emotional reaction. So we tend to hide behind the bush. Okay. It's like uh, when there is people uh, shooting with their guns, we tend to hide behind the wall. But then scientific evidence must take its role and drive decisions. Is it really a danger? to use reusables during a pandemic. So are recycling, composting, and above all, reuse a safe route or not during COVID-19? And in a mid-term vision, we have to carry out a critical assessment of the measures which are being considered and adopted globally. I mentioned the European Directive on Single-Use Plastics, but for instance, Canada adopted pretty much the same strategy. Now China is following on because they have got a national agenda on plastics and they say, yes, we also want to move a similar direction as Europe did. Of course, there will be differences and similarities, but all the world is considering going towards more reduction, more reuse of plastics. Is it affordable during a pandemic? So let's consider science. And this is an article which was uh, published on the New England Journal of Medicine back in February 2020. So during the first outbreak of COVID-19. At that time, it was only in China and in Italy. I'm based in Italy and Italy was the first country in the global north to be uh, uh, totally blown by uh, the pandemic. Uh, of course, uh, as I am a researcher and I am the scientific coordinator of Zero Waste Europe, I was considering myself whether the Zero Waste programs were viable during a pandemic. So I went to this article and this article was providing evidence of the survival of the virus, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, the scientific name of the coronavirus, on different types of surfaces. And they came out, they came up with the, the, the following outcomes. 
it survives 24 hours on cardboard, 24 hours on stainless steel, 72 hours on plastic. So between one day and three days, remarkably a longer time on plastics. But we will go back to that in a while. For the moment, I want to say, to share with you, it has got a certain survival time, but it's not forever, okay? Now, let's see. This pertains to composting. The survival of coronavirus at different uh, uh, temperature profiles, as those ones which may be achieved during a composting process. You know, composting releases biogenic heat, which is produced by microorganisms during composting. And so the temperature in the composting heat goes up to 50, 60, 70 degrees. So as you can see, in a few minutes, the viruses are totally killed. So we may come to a first round of conclusions. Composting is a totally safe route. There is no problem whatsoever with composting. Composting achieves temperatures, which makes it totally safe. So we may keep collecting organics, send them to composting, and then we have got a safe final soil improver to be used in agriculture. When it comes to packaging waste and recycling, it is safe to be handled also in the hand sorting recycling sites after some temporary storage. So we may collect plastics, we may collect cans, we may collect glass, we may collect paper, we may send it to recycling sites. We may keep a temporary storage of one to three days, depending on what which materials are we dealing with. And then we can also consider hand sorting by the local workers at the composting site. Uh, sorry, at the recycling site. But now, the most important, reuse. Of course, during the first outbreak of the pandemics, we already sent out a red alarm. You can see this uh, um, announcement by Greenpeace International. They said industry should not exploit COVID-19 to push for more plastic pollution. Because the industry was trying to rebuild a narrative according to which we need single-use plastics in order to keep everything safe and healthy. But let's go back to the evidence, the scientific evidence I already shared with you. We know there is a certain survival time on different surfaces, and I already told you, yeah, on plastics, it is the longest one. But that's not the key point. The key point is, whatever the material, for a certain time, the virus will be there. So, keep with me. If you increase the use of single-use materials, the higher will be the volume of materials coming from outside into your personal life, into your, your home, into your personal sphere, and this makes you more vulnerable, not safer. Because everybody may have touched the packaging, of course. Or, if we want to go to an extreme example, would you feel safer to drink from your own steel canteen, I have got mine, hmm, which you filled at your own tap, or from a plastic bottle, a single-use plastic bottle you just grabbed from the shelf in the supermarket, which may have been touched by anybody? So, you understand where we are going to. Uh, Single use is not intrinsically safer. Rather, in most uh, typical situations, it is the opposite. Reuse uh, tends to make you safer because typically, not always, but typically reusables are personal items and so they keep you safer. Also, and let me go to the end, we have to consider the timelines and the transitions. We, let's put it, everything in a time perspective. Now, we are in 2020, okay, uh, sorry, 2021, but in 2020, there was the virus, the viral outbreak worldwide, COVID-19. Uh, we have got long-term sustainable strategies. For instance, I'm making reference to the European uh, sustainable strategies. Uh, well, China is discussing similar strategies, as I already told you, but for instance, Europe adopted a long-term goal of net recycling 65% at 2035. Why so? Because we want to achieve the sustainable development goals as defined by UNEP, 
we want to create more jobs, we want to give more efficacy, uh, efficiency to our productive system, we do not want to import primary raw materials from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America anymore, we want to make the system fully circular. So this is a long-term vision in order to consolidate the production system in Europe according to more sustainable uh, paradigms. Also, we have got uh, mid-term goals, such as an obligation for separate collection of the organic set 2024. It will be mandatory everywhere in Europe by 2024. And in 2021, we will have, the, in, in July this year, we will have the entry into force of the directive of single-use plastics. So we will start banning straws, steerers, single-use cutlery, single-use plates, and so on and so forth. Now, we have got the pandemic, but we started the vaccination. And so, you know, already in many countries where the vaccination is going on, already the contagion is decreasing. And in a few years, it will be pretty much the same all over the world, of course. So, should we consider, of course, the pandemic is a huge issue. It is affecting and impacting our lives in such a huge way, but it is transitional by its own nature. So we do not have to think about the long-term strategies as if the pandemics would last forever and more. The pandemics will be transitional, and then we will go back to the long-term sustainable strategies, which have to be driven by more uh, economic benefits, more jobs for people, benefiting to communities, uh, sustainability in the management of resources, close the loop management of resources, and so on and so forth. So you may be confident that this may be done also during the pandemic. So welcome, keep going towards the zero waste, keep going towards utopia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your informative talk, Mr. Favino. Your report on what the zero waste vision and practice are how are and how they work in communities will truly help Carolinian students to build a sustainable and zero waste world. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Enzo. So I'd like to remind everyone that our meeting can only accommodate 100 people. So please tell your friends who are in the waiting room to watch the webinar via Facebook Live. So please visit the Facebook page of USC Collegiate Engineering Council, or you can access the link in the chat box. Thank you so much. So now we will proceed to our open forum. If you guys have any question or need clarification for Mr. Enzo, feel free to drop your questions in the Zoom chat box or in the Facebook Live comment section. We will be happy to relay them to Mr. Enzo. We'll give you a minute to type in your questions. All right, so I guess we have a question already. Mr. Um, Enzo, please. So for our first question for Mr. Favino, what can we individually do in our homes to minimize these wastes? Ooh, <laughs> not a simple question. No, uh, I'm happy because it may have uh, thousands of answers, of course. But to start with, uh, um, yes, as I already said, well, you know, in zero waste and in environmental sustainability, we always say think globally and act locally. 
And when we say act locally, it means also within your private lives, within your private homes. So the very same strategies we are defining at a global scale, at a global level, such as the single-use plastics directive, which is banning some items, even before similar uh, policies are adopted in the Philippines, you may start considering them yourselves. So packaging free shops, consider local produce, local shops, normally they are packaging free, or if you go to a supermarket, you may, uh, instead of um, purchasing over packaged materials, you may use your own Tupperware. You know what the Tupperware is? Tupperware are durable plastic containers, so you may go there and you may have your uh, hemp cuts, fish, meat cuts, dairy products filled into your Tupperware. Or whenever uh, the water is drinkable in your own community, it may not be the case in some communities, but in some communities it is drinkable. So why should you uh, buy uh, bottled water? Consider using your own tap water. Uh, so that's uh, the first things I would uh, recommend you. But if I may choose an item which is a symbol of the fight against the single-use plastics, I would start with straws. Straws are totally useless, utterly useless. They are only useful for people with some diseases, with some illnesses. For them, it may, they may be kept. But for normal people, for ordinary people, they are totally useless. So start uh, getting rid of the use of straws. Thank you, Mr. Salvino. Okay, for the next question. Also, from if our... I may, uh, so just a slight additional remark. Of course, since you are based in Asia, lucky you, <laughs> and the Philippines are such a beautiful country, uh, as I already said, a very big part of your municipal solid waste or your domestic waste is organics. So if you have got the possibility, start doing some home composting in your backyard. That's the best way to start a, an individual zero waste program. Thank you so much, Mr. Fabido. We'll surely um, take note of that. So for the next question, um, if we installed nets at our drain pipes, like in Australia, do you think our plastics in the ocean can be reduced? Can you say that again? Unfortunately, it was a little uh, bit short. Okay. If we installed nets at our drain pipes, like in Australia, do you think our plastics in the ocean can be reduced? I'm not fully sure I understand the question. If you install what? Nets of what? Nets in the drain pipes. I see. Um, uh, well, that's intended to cover... Well, the problem is that uh, for the moment it's very, very difficult uh, to install nets which are able to capture the microplastics, even though technology is working that direction. Well, you know that most of the microplastics actually are coming from a huge problem, which is uh, abrasion of tires. So we have to drive less. Technology will help us uh, defining materials which are less subject to abrasion. Uh, another big uh, producer of microplastics is washing the uh, synthetic textiles. So we have to revert to natural textiles such as cotton, wool, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, nets, uh, nets uh, may be a hope for the future. For the moment, uh, uh, the strategy is in its infancy for the moment. We are working on that anyway. Thank you so much, Mr. Favino. Thank you, sir. We have a question from Javier Hermosa. Is giving the right to repair electronics be able to reduce waste, especially on products such as smartphones where new ones come out every year? Indeed, this is a great question. And there has been a big fight both in the United States and in Europe. Well, in the United States, you know that the power of uh, big corporate companies is very, very big. And so, so far, they haven't been successful for the moment. But the fight goes on. And maybe with the new Biden administration, which is showing much more uh, sensitive to uh, environmental sustainability, they will have better success in the future. But in Europe, this has been established already. Also, Europe has defined uh, uh, a, a strategy to fight planned obsolescence. So what you were saying, you know, uh, they were making smartphones 
which were breaking after two years because the warranty was lasting two years and that the 25th month you had to buy a new one because your old one was not working anymore. So the right to repair and the fight on planned obsolescence will give us a huge help in this respect because there is a huge flood of waste electric and electronic equipment in our economy today. Thank you so much for that again, Mr. Rubino. So we have another question from Mr. Dan Diaz. So how do you find the Republic Act 9003 9, 9, law is in the incarnation be a solution to Phil's waste problems? Uh, I'm not sure I fully get the meaning of the question. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, Dan is a friend of mine. He was the one who invited me in this workshop. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, you were mentioning a local act. Uh, he, he mentioned Republic of 9003 law. I, 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 don't, I don't know the law, unfortunately, because can you see uh, the basic principles of the law? Okay. Hi, Enzo. I'm coming in. Um, yeah. Hi, Dan. Um, thank you for uh, being our keynote speaker. And yes, uh, here in the Philippines, we have this Republic Act 9003, or the Solid Waste Management Act. It's now in its 20 years where um, the local government really are asked to do this campaign for segregation at source, you know, recycling, all these yeah. things. But uh, it seems uh, there are new developments now, a lot of incineration projects that are, you know, uh, qualified to the guidelines of the Department of the Environment. So is uh, incineration a solution to this uh, archipelagic problem on waste as, as you have been visiting yeah. our country? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for clarifying, Dan. No, definitely not. Uh, let me say a resounding no. Also, Europe has taken a detour from incineration. Of course, incineration is accepted in Europe. It is not banned. But Europe is recommending to disinvest from incineration. Because incineration, there, it always comes a time at which incineration gets in the way of recycling. Uh, incineration is part of what we call the stranded uh, assets. If you invest in incineration, you get locked in the need to feed the monster because you need to ensure the payback of the investments. And the incinerators can only do that. They can only eat up mixed garbage in order to turn it into energy, by the way, with a very low energetic efficiency, which is 20-25% in Europe. So it is a waste of energy and not waste to energy. Also consider that incineration, you have got a huge percentage of organics. This keeps the calorific value of municipal solid waste very, very low in the Philippines, first of all. Secondly, the only way to increase the energetic efficiency of incineration is to consider some district heating. But district heating is to no use in the Philippines because you do not he need uh, heat at homes. I don't like what happens, for instance, in Sweden or in Norway, something like that. So this really makes uh, incineration totally not sensible in the typical uh, uh, situation in the Philippines. But the main problem with that is the locking effect uh, I already mentioned. Once you have got an incinerator, this hampers the local recycling, reduction and reuse programs because you need garbage to feed into, into the monster. And that's it. Lock in. Thank you so much, Sir Dan and Sir Enzo. Uh, we also have another question from Ray Michael Takaro. The UN recently released an article about curbing climate change by mitigating methane emission. How can we support this call on our own homes, or how can we contribute on this? This is a great question. Yeah, of course, we are very, very active on the UNEP report on methane from landfills. Of course, the best way to minimize methane from landfills is to divert your organics. Because you know that methane from landfills is basically produced by the organics, which are not separately collected and sent to composting. 
And if they end up in a landfill, they will undergo anaerobic degradation. They will produce methane. Some of the methane may be captured through the gas wells and flaring systems. But most of the methane gets into the atmosphere as a fugitive gas. And you know that methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, this is why Europe in 1999 adopted a, a landfill directive according to which we have to reduce by 65% biodegradable waste entering landfills. And also, most importantly, it, it stipulates an obligation on pretreatment of the waste that has to go into landfills. So, uh, by pretreatment, you may already minimize the methane potential production of the waste which gets landfills. But first and foremost, my advice would be start composting programs because with composting instead of producing methane in landfills you will produce a part of carbon dioxide which is biogenic anyway so it is carbon neutral you understand you know the basics of the climate change science whenever you produce carbon dioxide coming from biogenic materials it is considered to be carbon neutral because it's the same carbon which was fixed through the photosynthesis okay I know you know, but just for those who don't. Um, so you will produce a certain amount of carbon neutral carbon dioxide, but an impressive amount of a precious resource, which is compost, a soil improver. So you may use it to restore, to replenish fertility in, in, in soils and to lock up carbon in soils. And UNEP themselves, they have uh, drawn attention to this, uh, um, to this very issue that the soils, you know, the soils are the second largest pool of carbon in the planet after the oceans. So if we use compost in soils, we may increase the total amount of carbon which is in soils and we will have less carbon in the atmosphere where it produces uh, climate change and global warming. So, first and foremost, divert organics. Secondly, consider pretreating uh, waste before landfills. And pretreatment may be done also in a comparatively simple and low cost way through windrowing. Windrows, you know what windrows are? It's a composting like process. You can do that on mixed garbage, not to produce compost because that would be polluted but to reduce the methane potential production before burying your waste into the landfill body. All right, and now this concludes our open forum. Thank you so much to the audience for all your questions and, and to Mr. Enzo Favino for answering them. If you have it any more questions, pleasure. yes. <laughs> if you have any more questions regarding zero waste and reusables during the pandemic, please leave them in the chat box or in the comments section, as we will collate them and send them to Mr. Favino via his email. Once he responds to your questions, we will automatically forward them to your respective USC emails. We will now proceed to our next speaker for today. So our second speaker for today studied renewable energy at the Ligon Institute of Technology of the Mindanao State University and currently studies botany at Matthias H. Osnar Memorial College of Medicine, Incorporated. He is currently a resident agriculturist at Masters 4. We are beyond grateful to have him here with us for this webinar as he will surely educate us with his talk on kitchen waste to Bokashi composting. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Bernard Blanes with a virtual round of applause. Hello, greetings everybody. Nice to meet you. And I am so um, pleasured for having the time to speak with you guys. Um, good afternoon, um, San Carolinians. And good afternoon to Mr. Enzo Pogwini. A very good scientific approach on zero waste. It is my pleasure, sir, to see you and to witness your talk about zero waste. I, I was thinking, I was questioning myself, but who's Sir Enzo and what's with him? And I googled him up. And this guy is a ton of load of scientific ideas and contribution to the, to the world, not just to the community at Europe, but to the world itself. And especially with his connection with Mr. Dan Diaz, 
eventually Mr. Dan Diaz met with me here at the master's farm during the COVID pandemic. And I am very awestruck with the uh, events that continued in my life during this pandemic. Every crisis, guys, is an opportunity. So without further ado, I would like to introduce myself and my, um, my talk, especially uh, how we would deal with the solid waste. So it, Mr. Enzo, I've been introducing about the Zero Waste Program and with the Master Swarm, um, with collaboration of our NGO, the, the Seed Forecom, and in its initiatives of enterprise and development and sustainability, I was able to partner with this NGO and do something that would do impact to our community and hopefully to the world, yes. especially to what Mr. Enzo has been doing. So let me share my screen with you guys. So this is my screen. Did you, can you access it? Can you see it? So yeah, the master farm. Okay, thank you for the confirmation. So we are a developing farm, a working farm here at Alisa Cebu at the beautiful paradise of the Philippine Islands here in the archipelago. So this is a COVID response. Since I was studying biology, at March, I was here tasked to do a development on a farm execution. After I graduated from Agrea Farm School of um, Organic Agriculture Production, I was given opportunity to work and do my schooling here at Cebu City. So let me introduce to you what is Bokashi Fertilizer. Why we have to talk about Bokashi? Kashi is a process that converts food waste into similar organic matter into soil amendment, which adds nutrient and improves soil texture. So as Mr. So Mr. Enzo has been talking about, that carbon sinks at the atmosphere, carbon sinks at the ocean, and carbon sinks also at the soil. So... If you are looking for elements to sink carbon, you have to, we have to consider the soil itself. So the thing with organic bokashi is, it is not decomposed. So we are considering about composting, but with composting, we are decomposing a certain material that would lose its nutrients. But with bokashi, we are able to ferment the material, the waste material, in by the help of a specialized bacteria, the lactobacilli, which we use with the help of Hexbio. This will help the material to be fermented. The fermented matter is fed directly to the field or garden soil without requiring further time to mature. As a result, virtually all the input carbon, energy, and the nutrients enter the soil food web, neither inimited in a greenhouse and gases or any heat is wasted. So, Bokashi is very promising thing for all of us. So, if given the chance to learn about Bokashi, this is the time, guys, you see, this is the time to learn about Bukashi. Before I've been searching about Bukashi and now I'm teaching about Bukashi. Before I would like to have to, to, to join seminars to know about Bukashi, but now I'm telling about what to do with Bukashi and how to do it. So the best thing about learning is to know the technical side of the aspect. So Bukashi is used in agriculture as an organic amendment, soil amendment, or, uh, organic fertilizer, what you call it easily produced on a large scale compared to anaerobic type. So suitable materials for Bokashi. How to start? Everything has to start into something. So we start the Bokashi but with our initiative, especially, mm, what do we call it? Um, segregation. So we segregate our household waste. 
in segregation of household waste, we segregate the paper, the cardboard, and the newsprint together because they are composed of carbon. And we put it in a certain container, maybe a pot, maybe a bigger pot like this, or a bucket. Mm. Okay, so you put your carbon here. So here at the master's farm, at Cebu City, we use the carbonized rice farm. So this is used to be brown. The carbon, uh, the rice oil used to be brown, but because we carbonize it, we use a certain procedure to burn this incompletely to produce carbon transformation to the rice oil. We put it on a bucket. When we put it on a bucket, it is easily produced on large scale. And we put 50% um, of the volume into the bucket. So once you got it here, got 50% here, the middle, you should move more, more of the 50%. So you put 60%, 75% of the carbon content. So what, what to consider on your carbon content if you don't have activated carbon or carbonized rice huh? So you could use the paper, or you could use the cardboard. Here we got a lot of tons of paper because here at the master's farm, we are like a MRF, a material recovery facility. We use the ability to harness certain kinds of materials into our own um, benefit. So lots of carbon in the streets, lots of carb cartons, carbon cartons. We can use this to, to use this as our carbon content. So we keep it on a certain container. We keep all the stuff in there, guys. So the more we accumulate carbon, the more we have more potential in making the carbonized rice tau. Uh, no, we make uh, to, to keep carbon in our farm. So as much as carbon we accumulate, we put it on a, on a bucket for bokashi. We prepare it. We can also use chopped rice straw if you're on an agricultural land, if you have Lots of rice straw, you could use it, rice husk, or if you're on an agricultural land, you could use chopped corn stalks or chopped shredded sugar cane stalks or sawdust. So if you're in an urban setting, you could use other stuff like uh, newsprints. You don't have to throw it away. <laughs> So, Bokashi, so the next material for Bokashi is 50% less volume. So, what is your 50% less volume? This will involve the things that we throw in the landfill. So, almost 60 to 70% of our landfills globally is composed of kitchen waste. <laughs> we get it from the kitchen and we just throw it on the landfill without knowing because we are not that educated what to do because most of our education are from the advertisement to buy this and buy that. We are not that educated to do this and do that. But because of this very precious time, we, we allocated thanks to the University of San Carlos, which they really gave time to learn um, what we do with our kitchen waste instead of putting on the landfill, we put it on the Bokashi, especially at the time of pandemic where it's so hard to throw your household waste because um, the garbage man will refuse it because it will stink and they require us to segregate already. So what we do with our kitchen waste, like Mr. Enzo said, you use the Tupperware and put it somewhere. So we use the, the ice cream container. We put here the kitchen waste. So we got the kitchen waste. 
We got the fruit peelings, the banana peelings. Uh huh. We, we got the all sorts of stuff we get from the kitchen, guys. We got rice that was not eaten, we throw it. We got the fish meal. You know the fish meal, the fish gills that you get from the gills from the fish? We throw it. We throw it here. We put it here in the kitchen, kitchen bin. The bone meal. After you eat the fried chicken here at here at the Philippines, we use, we often eat at the Jollibee. So after you have the bone meal, you put it here in the bucket. What what else? You could use the duckweed or azolla, a very fast growing kind of aquatic plant. You can also include it here. You could use some plants like ipil ipil or kakawate or kalamungay. You don't use much of it when you are finished or done with it, especially with this kind of plant, this um, kangkong, mm -hmm. the sweet potato as um, leaves growing. We use this. Others, if you don't, if you don't like this kind of leaf, if it has holes in it, you so dirty or not good enough for kitchen use or food use, you put it on a, you put it here, right? And then what else? You could use animal manure. So you could use your dog poop, your chicken poop, your any poop from the the animals or your pets. You put you put a separate bin for it. You mix it here. And the coffee grounds, coffee grounds. After the breakfast from the coffee, you got coffee grounds, you put it here. So you got a separate conta container. This container is scientific called um, your source of nitrogen. So your first container would be the source of your carbon here. All the carbon, the paper, and the other container will be the source of nitrogen and other trace elements used for the garden. Trace elements or macronutrients used for your guard, your plants. So after it, you got to mix your bokashi. You, you got a separate container, your bokashi pin, your bokashi bucket. You put 50% volume of carbon or 60%, 50% volume up. This, this in the slide is our our sample of the bukashi, what we do in the large scale in the farm, but I will teach you also in a small scale that we use in the kitchen here, also here at the farm, in the kitchen. This is what we do with our bukashi. So 50% is carbon. We use the, the paper, 50% or up. And then what do, you, what do you do next? You prepare, you prepare the IMO. So you put, you, you wash the rice before we eat here in the Philippines or other countries in the Asia, we eat a lot of rice. Before we eat rice, we wash it with, with water. After we, we rinse it with water, some people without knowing Bukashi, they just throw it away in their, in their lavatories. But here at the master's farm and here at the master's kitchen, we use this water as our inoculant for our lactobacilli agent. We put it here in the bucket. Now, who gets the gas? South Carolina, USC, this is what we do with our who gets the gas, huh? our rice, rice wash. So, if you don't have other kind of Material you could use the the hex bio to inoculate it with specific lactobacilli nutrient. This is composed of thirty million poly, uh, colony forming units. You could buy this at uh, different pharmacies here at Cebu. Oh, it's upside down. I use this because it's so reliable. You could use the rice hull, but if you got this technology, why not? Right? So you open this and you mix the hex bio with your bokashi. One sachet is enough for one bucket and you mix it. This would really give you a very strong scientific way of approach to 
advocacy to fermentation, especially you are using a certain kind of bacteria, the lactobacilli, in a good population. So after mixing your lactobacilli on your carbon, in your book on your bukashi bucket, you put your kitchen waste into your bukashi bucket. If you have, if this is already 75% mold of carbon content, you only put maybe just 20%. So you still have 5% for a little bit of space for air. So you put all, you put your household clippings there, your banana peels, your mango, mango seeds, your main, your mango peelings. You could use your vegetable clippings. Um, you could use the eggshells. And you could use the banana peelings. Uh -huh. always, always sanitize, wash your hands after the procedure. So you got all this in your bokashi bucket. Mm -hmm. And you mix it. So this is our procedure here at the farms. We dilute the IMO in the molasses or we use the hex bio and mix it with the solid ingredients and be sure that the moisture content is only 30 to 40 percent so not so soggy. Not too wet, but just wet enough to wet the solid ingredients. Not to make baha or the tsunami. Not too much water, I say. <laughs> and you ferment it for one week or two weeks. So you put this bukashi bucket somewhere. You, you doesn't have any sunlight, direct sunlight on it. And you don't put it somewhere where it could be drowned in rain. And you put cover on it, a lid. So you could cover it also with manila paper. And you put a string on it so it would hang tight. If your bucket has a lid, a, a lid, you could cover it with its own lid. As much as possible, you could use something so that air would not come inside of it. So pests would not come into it. This is now your bokashi bucket. So management during fermentation, you, if it's on a large scale, they turn it, they turn it so that the mixture will be mixed because the liquid part of it will sink in and the solid will stay up. So if you mix it, it's much better. So after one week or two weeks, this bukashi bucket will have a sweet sour smell and its temperature is stable. So after it, you could store your bukashi in an air dry container. You could pack it on sacks and it can be kept for six months. Uh, usage of bukashi is soil fertilizer, compost agent, treatment of kitchen waste. So compost agent, you could use your bukashi to mix it with your compost and it will help your composting. Uh, key ingredient in mud bowls, you could also use your bukashi into mud bowls. Put and throw it on the rivers, it will help your drainage system. It will have microbial life to get away, get rid of the stinks. And you can use it for to treat manures, especially in your on your livestock. So total days of preparation is seven to fourteen days. Mm. What are other things that we could do with our bokashi? So in our bukashi, once it's after two weeks, and this bucket is already two weeks old, we mix the cons the, the we mix the components of it into our soil here in the pot, and we let it stay for two weeks. We mix it, and after two weeks more. We, we plant certain plants 
We plant the kangkong, the kamote tops, and the alubati because it is fast growing. So after two weeks, this pot where you have inoc you inoculated with bukashi, you could put your plants here, especially the sample of kangkong. You put it here, you plant it like this dip. And then this thing, this pot, we put it on a shaded area away from direct sunlight, maybe near a window. And then we let it stay for one week. After it, we put it somewhere where it could receive sunlight. And if you let the bukashi stay for a longer time in your soil, this is the sample of a soil with bukashi for three months already. You could see that it is rich in organic content. It's so porous. It has good moisture content and water holding capacity. So Bukashi is very promising. Um, it is so promising for us because it's what we practice and it's very effective. And because of its effectivity, we have been using it in our kitchen. We have been using it on our community. We are able to teach our community about it. And we are also able to get the kitchen waste and the, in, uh, the waste from our markets, our neighboring markets, where they're able to get their waste, their waste from the calendaria, their waste from the, the fish gills, the blood, the blood from the fish, we use it, we put it in a bucket and we get it occasionally. And imagine someday when the classes will be on up again, we could use this on our universities, especially on our mm, um, where we eat on our universities. We could use it. We could use it on our university food stalls. We could implore some measures on or a university ordinance and a college ordinance so that they would keep their kitchen waste on a certain bucket and eventually tie up with communities who practice Bukashi or practice the Bukashi itself at the colleges or eventually practice the Bukashi in your kitchens. Because of what we've been doing, uh, we are able to have opportunities, especially at other companies where they are outsourcing us to teach them about Bukashi system, especially the Virginia Foods here at Cebu. We're able to have um, a deal with them soon. So Bukashi is very effective. That's what we use. And what's other use of Bukashi? We, we use it to feed our chickens. So we don't buy the chicken food anymore. We don't buy the chicken pellets from the, from the agricultural supply. We've been feeding our chickens with Bukashi for a year and two months, three months since the pandemic, we've been feeding them with Bukashi. And because of the strong strong ability of the lactobacilli from the hex bio, they were able to be resilient from diarrhea. So that's very promising with Bukashi. And also Bukashi doesn't emit what we call methane because Bukashi is anaerobic. It doesn't use air to ferment. It only uses the lactobacilli. It is able to not make methane output. So we use the Bukashi because it is very useful and it has so much positivity in it. The more we do Bukashi, the more we research about Bukashi, the more we are able to share it to other people because it's not just something that we talk about, it's something that we do. So guys, if you have any other questions concerning the talk, you could question me on the open forum. And thank you so much. Sir Lorenzo, thank you, and you have the mic. Thank you so much for your comprehensive talk, Mr. Bernard Elanes. Your presentation on kitchen waste to Bukashi composting is indeed a significant innovation that will help Carolinian students contribute to society. Now we will proceed to our open forum. So if you have any questions for Mr. Bernard, please do not hesitate to address them in the Zoom chat box or in the Facebook Live comment section. We will relay them to Mr. 
for in order for him to answer those questions. We'll give you a minute to do so. And we have a question from the audience. For the first question, is there a possibility that the Bokashi will develop bacteria or molds that are airborne which can be harmful to breathe in? Um, Bokashi, because the use of lactobacilli, I will explain, it is a condition like what is happening here in our mouth. So our mouth is filled with lactobacilli. So Bokashi is already happening here in our mouth. So when there is other bacteria present in our mouth because of the lactobacilli, the bacteria will not thrive because it's overpopulated with the lactobacilli already. So it is way of protecting us, this lactobacilli, because this lactobacilli, when they ferment something, they produce the lactic acid and no other bacteria can, can thrive with it. I don't know with viruses, but on research base, bacteria, other bacteria cannot thrive on a rich lactobacilli environment. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Bernard. So for the next question from Mr. Ray Tagaro. Hi, Sir Bernard. How do, you, how do we ensure that the organic materials in our Bukashi setup would proceed to aerobic decomposition and will not undergo anaerobic decomposition, which produce methane? So when you talk about anaerobic decomposition, first of all, it's without air. So you have to cover, cover your bucket. After you cover your bucket, you must ensure also that your bucket is in compliance of the ratio of 50% of carbon and 50% less nitrogen content. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. We also have another question from Engineer Wong Marcon. How does Bokashi differentiate from Takakora? Um, Takakora is, we use a lot of molasses, we use a lot of different kinds of bacteria. The thing with Bokashi is, it's very useful because we don't have to buy the molasses anymore. We only use the lactobacilli and if you don't have the time to buy the it's bio, you could use the rice wash. So it's very accessible. The thing is, during the pandemic, the thing that we could access without transporting to other places to buy materials. That's what we do. And with the Bokashi technical know-how, we are able to do it without going here and there. And that saves us time and resources. Thank you so much, Mr. Bernard, for that. Okay, I guess there's no more question already. And that ends our open forum. If you have any more questions for Mr. Lanes regarding kitchen waste to Bokashi composting, please leave them in the chat box or in the comment section as we will collate them and send them to Mr. Lanes via email. Once he responds to your questions, we will automatically forward them to your respective VSC emails. So once again, thank you so much, Mr. Favino and Mr. Lanes for your very insightful talk. You now my understanding of proper waste management has increased in the scope of this webinar, and that is just two out of the six speakers we have for today. So, you know, recycling and composting are two perfect habits to establish because it enhances so the soil and water quality while also lowering the greenhouse gas emissions. Right, Enzo? Exactly, Maria. Let us now proceed to our third speaker for the day, who will certainly provide us with additional useful information. Our third speaker is an exceptional leader, an active advocate of environmental organizations, an international ambassador for Mother Earth, and a beauty queen. She is presently a climate reality leader, a member of the NAFFAA Region 5 Board of Directors, and the Vice President of the Philippine American Society of Colorado. She also holds the title of Mrs. Eco International 2019. She is unable to attend today's conference, however, but she has prepared a video of her talk entitled Zero Waste Tips for all of us. So please help me in extending a warm welcome to Ma'am Sheila DeForest.
Okay, um, there have been some technical difficulties at the moment, so just wait for a bit. Okay, I'd also like to remind everyone to please stay until the end to access the sign out and evaluation forms. So keep a close eye out for the link which will be sent after the last speaker's open forum. So everyone who completes the sign in, sign out, and evaluation forms will receive an e certificates and a CDS point. Okay, we're presenting the video for Ms. everyone. Good afternoon. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Maayong hapon sa inyong tanan. I'm Sheila Tudor De Forest, Mrs. Econ International 2019. I would like to thank the University of San Carlos Collegiate Engineering Council for this opportunity to join your zero waste living even during a pandemic session today. We have a global plastic problem. It is estimated that only 9% has ever been recycled and processed. And the rest ends up in trash, landfills, and unfortunately the environment. This pandemic also increased single plastic use in terms of medical waste, personal protective equipments, non-recycled plastic bags, non-recyclable takeout containers, single-use plastic cutleries and straws, and many more. Unfortunately, we've also seen an increase of masks and gloves being thrown in the environment. You will see them on beaches, on roads, our streets even, littering. So how do we go low waste or zero waste during these challenging times? Even before the pandemic, we are already trying, or I personally have been lowering my waste output. We have a recycling service that collects trash and, gar um, and recyclables in our development. Our Trash bin has been downgraded to the lower container, the smaller container, and our recyclables, we don't even fill our bin halfway every two weeks. So is going low waste or zero waste possible despite these challenging times? I would say yes. We just have to make the conscious decision in our daily lives how we shop, how we consume, how we use product, how we vote with our wallets is one of the ways that we can actually lessen our waste output. I've been using for many years now what I will call ABCD of going zero waste. Let me share it with you. A stands for avoid. Avoid single-use plastics, like plastic bags, plastic straws, plastic cutlery, styrofoam cups, face masks, plastic or latex gloves, buying bottled water, and this is my biggest pet peeve, personal care products that are being sold in sachets, like conditioner, shampoos, and detergents. This is... A headache when you do cleanups you can see all the all the plastic sachets that are littering the environment so please if you can avoid buying thingy in this form it will be very very helpful for your waste output as well B be conscious of what you buy and the packaging they're in. When you go grocery shopping or when you buy 
in markets or supermarkets, do you buy fruit and vegetables that are wrapped in plastic? This plastic is definitely headed for the trash. So when, when you go shopping next time, bring your own bag. And don't take from the store. And make sure that the packaging they're in, if they are in some form of packaging, that they are in recyclable or compostable packaging. This also goes for the items that you purchase, like personal care products. Make sure that they come in recyclable packaging as well. Glass, if possible. C. Carry and use reusable containers. So bring your own water bottles, your own shopping bag, your own food containers, and use a washable face mask. D. Dig a compost pit or build a soil making facility for your biodegradables. So that it applies to your food scraps, for your garden waste or yard waste because composting helps make your soil healthy and planting a garden or trees help sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So you make your own soil. Let me share with you a zero waste cheat sheet as well that you can save on your phone or your smart device that you can refer to when you go shopping or even at home. So let's start with refuse. Refuse single-use items. Reuse. Find creative use or ways to reuse items like do-it-yourself or arts and crafts. Reduce. Reduce how many items come into your life and home by making conscious purchases of high-quality items instead of cheap plastic. Recycle. Find your local recycling center, and the products they take. If your barangay doesn't have one, organize with your neighbors and make a materials recovery facility where they can bring their recyclables. Grow. Whenever possible, grow your own food. You don't need a big garden. You can have vegetables or plants in pots. Recycle um containers can be used as well this will help sequester carbon from the environment and in terms of food security you know where your food is coming from and it will be organic when you grow it at home compost compost your food scraps and your yard waste and anything that is biodegradable it will help enrich your soil as well without using fertilizers. Replace. As their life cycle comes to an end, replace plastic items or containers with more durable, sustainable options such as glass, bamboo, or stainless steel. Join. Join your city's sustainable committee if your city or your barangay doesn't have a sustainability committee, talk to your elected officials on the merits of having a sustainability committee. If not, organize and engage your neighbors and friends into living more sustainably. Not included in that list is Sorry for the interruption, so we're facing some technical difficulties. So let's just wait for um, the screen to be played. Okay, I just want to 
say thank you to Pinoy Basurair Corporation, Zero Waste Academy Philippines, and Sustainable Energy and Enterprise Development Communities, or also known as the Seed Forkal, for collaborating with us this event. And also, I'd like this to inform everyone to please stay until the end of this webinar to access the sign out, sign out and evaluation forms. Keep a close eye out for the link, which will be sent after the last speaker's open forum. Everyone who completes the sign in and sign out forms will receive an e certificate and a CS point. So let's now proceed. We would like to express our deep gratitude to Ma'am DeForest. There are so many facets to zero waste living, and with your talk, we were able to certainly get off on the right eco footprint with some zero waste tips. No, I totally agree with you, Enzo. Look, can you imagine producing almost one ton less trash in a single year? That would be awesome if all of us would. You know, practice such an app. So, would you take the challenge, Enzo, in living a zero waste lifestyle? <laughs> I, can't promise you, I can't promise you that I can significantly reduce my waste, but I will make the absolute effort to live a zero waste lifestyle. Mom DeForest Talk encourages me to put these zero waste tips into immediate action, as they would definitely have a crucial effect on both my life and the environment. You know, that's true because we don't have to do everything right away in the mindset. But starting small and working on the basics would be a great stepping stone toward a zero waste lifestyle. Mam so, DeForest Dif is unable to join us in our live session today. But if you have any queries for Mom Sheila DeForest, please leave them in the chat box or in the comments section and we will compile them and send them to her. Once she responds to your questions, we will automatically forward them to your respective USC emails. Um, we will upload the, the recorded video of Ms. DeForest in our USC College of Engineering Facebook page, so make sure to check it out as well. So at this juncture, we will now move on to our next speaker. Our fourth speaker for today is an advisor in sustainable energy and enterprise development for communities also known as the Seed for Com Sapangalaga chapter. She is a licensed professional teacher in Concepcion Misamis Occidental. She is also a zero waste minimalist. Carolinians, we are honored to have her here as she will enlighten our minds in creating a strategy of how to create a zero waste home from a minimalist perspective. Let us give a warm welcome to Ma'am Marilyn Yolanda S. Gillian. Waste with Minimalism. 
with the drastic changes brought about by COVID-19 pandemic, especially in health and environment, going zero waste with minimalism is my solution. With our current waste problem, ito yung nakikita kong solusyon paano magiging zero waste yung Pilipinas. Change is inevitable. Change is constant. But change is tough. I started zero waste lifestyle maybe around year 2004 and yet until now ang hirap pa rin abutin ng zero waste. Back in year 2019, I read a book about Fumiya Sasaki. It's about minimalism. After reading all books with similar content, I realized and decided to become minimalist and combine zero waste with minimalism in quest to attain the zero waste lifestyle. Kasi with minimalism, it's a lifestyle that eliminates the unnecessary and focus on what really matters in your life. Kaya paunti-unti, ma-lelesen na po yung kalat natin sa ating sarili. Sa minimalism and zero waste kasi merong basihan or rule paano ka magiging minimalist and paano ka magiging zero waste. With zero waste minimalism rules, ang dami mong i-let go para ma-accommodate mo yung mga bagay na mas maganda and mas importante. With these rules, ang dami mga bagay na di mo na matatapon at dahil wala ka nang masyadong binibili. Refusing is the best way to go zero waste. You are creating a positive change in yourself by assessing and evaluating what truly matters. Minimalism will help me dissociate from social norms, especially in consumerism in this digital age. Disclaimer lang po. I am not referring to the brands and companies on these pictures na nakikita ninyo. But I am referring on the items and the waste or clutter they create. When you refuse to buy these or limit your consumption on these, according to the law of supply and demand, mas liliit po yung kalat natin. And our natural resources and environment ang makaka-benefit ng mabuti. Invest in yourself. Going zero waste with minimalism is mahirap. Lalo na lahat na nakakapaligid sa iyo ay nagiging kaahaway mo na dahil di, di ka na nila gets. Pero dahil malayo pa ang lalakarin natin from zero waste, I have to invest in myself first. I have to endure the process and let everyone testify my sacrifices are worth emulating. I first invested in making time for my lifestyle and advocacy para makita ko na yung progress and eventually ma-reach ko na yung goal ko. Kahit gaano ako kabisi sa school, I always find time to maintain and establish actions to promote and sustain zero waste. I started zero waste living way back 2004 and minimalism last 2019 and yet the challenge is heightened every year. Ang hirap talaga pero kakayanin dahil kung di mo gagawin, mas mahihirapan ng earth mag-recover. After long years of sacrifice, abstinence, and persistence, Nag-invest na ako sa karelasyon ko. <laughs> I started out with my family and then friends, neighbors, and then with communities. Matagal-tagal din bago nila ako sinuportahan. So, balit, napakasarap pala talaga kapag nag-harvest ka na sa mga itinanim mo. This pandemic, I started to invest in the young. According to Proverbs 22.6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Little by little, tinuturuan ko silang magtapo ng tama, maging responsibilidad sa trash nila, and magmotivate din sa ibang bata. After my trainings from Climate Reality, the goal of Zero Waste Philippines ay sobrang mahaba pa at matagal pa. 
ninais kong mapabilis ang daloy at movement nito sa pamamagitan ng pag-a-advertise, pag-promote, and pag-recruit. May mga ibang taong gusto mo zero waste pero nahihirapan kaya gumagawa na lang ako ng mga strategies para makapag-zero waste sila pa unti-unti. With zero waste minimalism, going zero waste this pandemic is very possible. Much possible kapag inaraw-araw mo. We can only predict our future by the lifestyle we have today. So I dare to be a zero waste minimalist because I only want to see results of a cleaner, greener, safer earth and gusto ko maging significant yung existence ko. Maraming salamat po! Thank you very much for that eye-opening presentation, Mom Juliana. Evidently, minimalism is a great practice for reading yourself of life's excess in order to concentrate to, on what's important. I could not agree with you more, Maria. Unfortunately, Mom Juliana is unable to join in our live session today. But if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box or in the comments section as we will collate them and send them to Miss Juliana via her email. Once she responds to your questions, we'll automatically forward them to your respective ESC emails. We are down to the last two speakers for today's webinar. Wow, we've come such a long way already, Enzo. Yes, it's really necessary because Earth is the only home that we have, and it provides air, heat, and other necessities for us and all other animals that are fundamental to our health, quality of life, and survival. No, we are truly honored to have these distinguished speakers who advocate in protecting the natural environment. So moving on to our program, we will now introduce our next speaker. Today's fifth speaker is the Project Coordinator of Sustainable Energy and Enterprise Development for Communities, also known as Seed for Com. He's the Chapter Coordinator of the Seed for Com in Metro Manila. He is also a climate reality leader, having received training from former U.S. Vice President Al Gore during the July 2020 Global Training. He is also an advocate and a lover of Philippine biodiversity, particularly Philippine native flora. In addition, he is currently the project leader of C4 Combs Food Security Project in Urban Permaculture Forming in Quezon City and North Caloocan which incorporates women empowerment and inclusive community growth. He is also a dedicated environmental campaigner against quarrying, mining, and illegal activities. With this dedication and passion for protecting our Mother Earth, he is absolutely extraordinary. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Mr. Clarence Gio Almoite with a virtual round of applause. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, audio boy. Yeah, so good, good morning, good morning, good uh, afternoon to USC and thanks again for inviting us here with Sir Dan. So I think the slides are I shared now. I have slides. Yeah. So uh, just this uh, uh, short presentation. Kasi kanina na-discuss na yung about plastic. So, next slide. Yan, nag, meron na kayong background on plastic. So, ito. Uh, Philippines is one of the 17 megadiverse countries, which means it houses to 70 of 80% of the world's biodiversity. So, almost all animals and plants can be seen in the Philippines. No? With that, next slide. Tayo rin ay isa sa hottest of the hotspots na kung saan uh, marami ang activities na nagkakos ng extinction, no? high probability of species extinction. No? Yan ay due to different activities, man-made or natural activities. Next slide. So also, uh, we are also the DAB no, as center of the center of the world's marine biodiversity. So, tayo ang center and nasa atin din ang center. So, it is in Batangas, in Verde Island Passage, just south of Manila, of Metro Manila. So, it is rich in marine biodiversity. Okay, next slide. Of course,
course, our natural resources, this biodiversity products, it has its own or it has its uh, distinct values no? that contributes to large percentage of the Philippine economy. Okay, it's billions. Okay, next slide. So with that, uh, due to high number of biodiversity, due to that very proud moment on biodiversity in the Philippines, we are also prone to different uh, damages. You know, the principal drivers, habitat loss, climate change, which is the larger aspect, the larger problem, the umbrella of all the problems, over-exploitation of species, this is the over-extraction, invasive alien species, introducing one species to a new environment, which is very bad, and of course, our topic, pollution. Next slide. Okay, so here, uh, based on the recent data no, on Statista, we are third, ranked third by uh, the world's, uh, world, world's worst polluter. However, however, this data, uh, yung data na ito, ito ay, uh, kung titignan natin yung backstory, it is not just the consumer. No? It is the producer na kung saan sila yung nagpaproduce ng plastic. They have the resources to produce plastic. And of course, they also have, they must have uh, the resources to reduce it, no? if ever. So next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide please. So yeah, uh, scientists from all over the world have been introducing this more plastics than humans on the planet. And you will see it here in one bird. Okay, next slide. So yung isang ibon na ito, dinisect yung kanyang coma. Okay, sige, next slide. Sorry. So yan, yung isang ibon, dinisect ang kanyang stomach at ang laman ay mga small plastics, plastic cups, uh, mga plastic products. Okay, next slide. And then, dumating na rin sa point na yung mga yung biodiversity natin, specific, specifically the birds, they are looking for food. Uh, puro plastic plastic products na yung kanila nakakain na consume nila okay next slide and then this one the, the most ito yung mang, ito yung bumida no na ang diet ng isang pawikan ito ay ang, ang diet niya kinakain niya ay mga jellyfish so ang itong plastic na ito na distinguish niya as jellyfish pero nakain niya ito so na consume niya okay it, affected the health of the animals, not just human health. Okay, next slide. Ito rin, uh, even the starfish, the smallest, the small starfish, it is also affected by plastics, no? Ito mga, mga, mga styrofores, no? Nag, uh, napepenetrate yan sa system ng ating marine organisms, even at the coastal areas. Uh, next slide. However, uh, we are considered as the first no, in terms of clean up participation. So, marami mga movements, organizations, coalition na may aim to clean up the coastal uh, from reach to reef. No? Uh, yan, tayo ay number one. Next slide. So yan, ito yung mga products na nakakolekta, nagkakaroon ng waste auditing and of, aside from brand auditing, yung mga nakakolekta, they are definitely plastic derivatives. Plastic products such as food wrappers, cigarette butts, synthetic materials, no? plastic bottle, any plastic. Yan. Sila yung gumibida sa mga nakakolekta nating basura. Next slide. Yan, so... Even the balloon itself ay isang uh, synthetic material na nakaka-apekto sa ating environmental health. Next slide. 
Okay, next slide. Pati itong mga face masks natin, sila ay nag-end up na rin sa ocean. As discussed by uh, by Ms. DeForest, Sheila DeForest earlier. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So, ito yung isa sa mga pinaka-dangerous, the microplastic na kung saan it can penetrate at the deepest of the deep uh, the deepest of the deepest of the ocean. No? And it also penetrates to small fishes. Yeah, more, more, more plastics than fishes. Ang microplastics sila ay degraded. Sila ay galing sa large plastics. They are the degraded parts. Okay, next slide. So yan, mahaba ang life cycle ng plastic. However, if they meet that maximum life uh, span, hindi ibig sabihin na mawawalan sila or mabubulo. They are just degraded. Kung may degrade lang sila into smaller pieces. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So what is our intervention in the Philippines? We have the Republic Act 9003 or the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act. This was enacted to address solid waste management uh, in the Philippines. No? Starting from the local or barangay level. However, ito ay matanda na it was enacted last 2000. So it is 21 years of age na. So next slide. Medyo matanda na siya. No? Yan, so, ayan, it aims to uh, recycle, reuse, and compost. No? Ang pinaka-aim niya is walang matapon sa mga landfills sa and sa ocean. Okay, next slide. And ipinagbabawal din ang incineration o yung pagsusunod ng basura kasi it can affect uh, human health, of course, the atmosphere. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. Maraming mga typology ng waste. According yan, uh, nakadepende siya on the national perspective. Next slide. Ito, binibigyan ng power ang LGU okay, to, uh, to, uh, to address these uh, waste management concerns. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. So, yan. So, we should treat our waste as a resource, so not a garbage. So, itong mga basura natin, hindi dapat siya mag-end up sa landfill, mag-end up sa ocean. Ito dapat ay mag-end up sa uh, useful way, no? to, uh, to improve way para sa ating lifestyle din naman ito and para sa earth, para sa planet. No? So, yung mga basura, may mga iba na nagagamit pa na pwede pa natin magamit. And uh, one part din yung pagiging uh, efficient, no? resource efficient kung saan. Hindi tayo nagsasayang ng mga materials. Kung ano lang ang nasa capacity natin to produce, to utilize, and to manage. Next slide. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, so thank you and if you have any questions, sige, I'm open. Thank you so much for that very insightful talk, Mr. Clients Gio Almoite. Your talk on plastic pollution and marine litter and how they affect Philippine biodiversity will certainly inspire students to take initiative and find ways to strive for a sustainable future. All right, now we will hop right in to the open forum for Mr. Clarence. So guys, just type it in in the chat box or in the comment section in our Facebook Live for your question to Mr. Clarence. We will give you a minute to drop your question. Okay, we have our first question from the audience. Do you believe the actions that the other speakers have said can greatly contribute to a reduction of plastics? 
Yes, of course, no. We have to be inspired by them and also we have to practice it on ourselves. No, hindi lang yung we are inspired by ganito, we are inspired by ganyan. We have to start also by ourselves, no. Kasi tayo rin naman ang at the end of the day, it's ourselves na may decision, no, sa buhay natin. So, uh, these practices may not be new or new to you, pero ang pinaka-end, ang pinaka-lesson or ang pinaka-gusto niyang iparating sa ating mga participants is that you practice, is, you practice it on your way. We have the intervention, we have the recommendation, we have the suggestions, we have the practices, we have the uh, experience. So it's now you, kayo naman, no? Paano niyo siya i-practice at your home, sa mga bahay, no? Even at small ways. So, yun siya. Of course, it will greatly uh, contribute to uh, having a zero-waste lifestyle. You know? Definitely. Thank you so much, Mr. Almoite, for that. We have another question from Mr. Tagarao. There is an emerging technology now used in India that uses bubble barrier in rivers or water streams as a way of filtering plastic debris or marine debris thus preventing marine pollution. On your own opinion, will this technology can be applicable to the Philippines or are we ready to use this technology? Yes, uh, generally, these technologies are good. No, These technologies are good. Pero, uh, dapat ma-address niya yung at source. Ang pinaka-problem natin yung source, sino ba yung nagpo-produce ng plastics mo. These interventions are just band-aid solutions to stop yung pag-drain ng plastic sa iba't ibang waterways. Pero as, year, as years pass by, ganyan pa rin yung mangyayari. Diba? Ang pinaka-solution dito is let us address yung source. Sino ba yung pinagmumula ng plastic? Ano ba yung mga... Ano ba yung mga technology na ginagamit nila to produce plastic and how can we solve it? So I would suggest at source. No? Pero these technologies po are good. No? Pero not in a long run kasi we continue to produce plastic and waste. So we have to address yung source. No? Kung yung pinagmulan ng plastic. Thank you for that, Mr. Almoite. Thank you so much, Mr. And that concludes our open forum. Thank you so much, Mr. Clarence G. Almoite, for taking the time to answer all of their questions. I'm certain that they have fully grasped the message you want to convey in your presentation. We're down to our last, but definitely not, but not the least speaker for today. We've learned a lot from the five speakers, and in, in addition to this speaker, we will definitely garner another useful information that we will apply in our daily lives. Our last speaker for today is the country coordinator of Philippine Waste Platform, Executive Director of Sustainable Energy and Enterprise Development of Communities, also known as seed 4 com He's the chairman at Zero Waste Academy and general secretary of the Philippine Marine Environmental Protection Association. Please help us welcome Mr. Dan Diaz. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Lorenzo and... Uh, Thank you, Maria, for this um, hosting, no, this uh, partnership with C4Com and University of San Carlos, the College of Engineering um, Council College, right, as well as our uh, corporate uh, partner who is um, helping us in the city of Cebu, no, in um, tackling our solid waste, uh, Pinoy Basurero. Uh, corporation. So much has been talked. The science is so clear um, that there is a threat on microplastic that is infiltrating not only uh, the ocean. So right now I'm at the back of the ocean. We just had our island hopping with our partners, Cola Box, because this month is the month of the ocean as well as our month for farmers and fisher folks. So for the farmers and fisher folks, we have a livelihood program in different islands here in Cebu 
So these uh, islands need to increase their production or catch of, of fish. And at the same time, we have a program that we are uh, implementing since 20, 2015 on uh, cleanups. So aside from cleanups, we do what we call uh, prevention and collaboration. So in the islands now that you can see here, that's already like Bohol. Uh, these are the islands of Olango, which is a migratory bird. Um, we are um, greening it up. So it's not just a uh, clean up, but greening. When you say greening, we have to do reforestation as well on the water. The importance of seagrass, the importance of mangroves, beach forest, and the importance of fruit bearing trees. So we have to act now. It's not just talking about uh, zero waste, really based from uh, the science and data, each one of us contributes like half a kilo of garbage every day. So the, two, the terms here are garbage, trash, and waste. So mm. garbage, trash goes to landfill. Oh. Waste is a resource. So we have to identify these two, these, these two items. And we know um, based on the waste analysis characterization study, um, more than 50% are organic waste. So the solution is do compost, do bukashi, and to prevent plastics, uh, containers, um, packaging, grow your own food. You, that's why we have this food gardens movement launched last year. We have this master's farm. We have uh, seed for farms, uh, farms in QC and in Caloocan with PWD. We have to do that as well, stars in our home and limit this uh, generation of waste. So the important thing here is not segregation. The important thing here is reduction. So zero waste is how much waste are you contributing each day? With the COVID pandemic, are you buying online? Are you buying with so many packaging? Or are you cooking? Are you making, growing your own food? Because the moment you do that, you save money. Zero waste doesn't have to, you to spend so much money with technology. You don't have to invent another machine because that's a correct way, right? But the prevention, as Enzo mentioned, at really look at the source. And then um, Bernard mentioned about turning this uh, kitchen waste into bukashi. And Sheila talks about a way that we can do. Like right now, this uh, echo bag is made from a textile from this uh, industry in Mepsa, made by our young people, and it creates jobs. I've been using it now for a year. This was during the time of COVID where we gather all these textiles to make, you know, face masks, um, these bags, and sell them online as an enterprise for the community. And then farmers, we sell their products online as well as, as, well as, farm, as, well as our fisher folks. So it should create um, entrepreneurial uh, activity that will help our vulnerable communities. Look at those small islands. Their problem is not on segregation. Their problem is there's no collection. How can you collect uh, all those trash with a low budget and then transport in the city? Who's going to spend? You know? So everything that they go, that they buy from the mainland just been thrown into the ocean. You know? That's why we also have this campaign. I think uh, San Carlos, we have a partner with civil engineering with the Echo Bricks, the plastic uh, single use and uh, put them into this bottle and we create green spaces. This is not a final solution, but this is, we cannot really avoid because the companies are keep on producing the single use plastic. The only way to live this uh, movement is to recruit. The last part that we're talking is recruitment. We have to recruit those who are watching us, we're like a hundred uh, on the Zoom and maybe Facebook is gonna record it, make it viral, share it. And uh, recruit everyone. Be aware that all our trash is just on the planet Earth. We're not throwing trash to Mars. So now China has landed in Mars. Now Israel uh, uh, in the Miss Universe talks about a face mask that she wore as a gown, you know. And the national costume is the face mask, you know. So we are now being wrapped with plastic because we keep on choking the planet with plastic. Nature is, you know, attacking us again uh, by, you know, uh, covering ourselves with, with face masks and face shields. And to, to lessen the spread of this virus, we make sure these plastics are not being thrown anywhere. So you keep it in your home, put it in this uh, 
EcoBricks as a solution because when you introduce technology, you need machine, you need people, you need manpower, etc. So my last point is uh, is this: increase composting and increase recycling rate. The Philippines should have a deadline. The Philippines should have a target, like in 2030, there should be what? What's the transition on this single-use plastic? And the substitute is aluminum tin can. Aluminum tin can in all the refreshments because these tin cans are of higher value and these are recyclable. And these can be used all over again. So stop these sort of plastics that can be recycled, but it's only 9%. And here in the city of Cebu, there are only less recycling industry, you know? So you have to do this archipelagic um, solution. If the local government cannot solve these problems on different type of waste, then ban it, you know? Ban, give them a deadline. Since we cannot manage it, so better remove that. So we, um, we have to also redesign. As engineers watching us, redesign of this packaging. Uh, redesign that this will last. Re redesign that they are repairable. And in that way, we lessen the residual waste and we lessen this trash that goes to um, pyrolysis, close burning, and lessen in the landfill. So go local. And we know uh, we're so happy that Enzo from Europe, uh, he had made time to be with us, telling us the direction of the world on waste management because here in Europe, I've been there and uh, appreciate what they have do, been doing. And the U.S. as well has to take, you know, this responsibility of not burning so much carbon emission because these small islands like the Philippines are suffering from impacts on this global warming. So to end, stop talking, stop zooming, let's act, acting. Let's act that every, every day, we lessen our waste, we reduce, and we refuse. Thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, who are been part of seed com and to the organizers, the University of San Carlos. Um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to amplify our message. It's not just message. It's not just talking. It's acting. If you want to volunteer and live the zero waste, like our page, seed com go to our um, Zero Waste Academy Philippines, and let's continue this dialogue through action. Thank you very much. And I don't need to have question and answer because we have a limited time. So it's about time to act. Thank you. Thank you so much for your extensive talk, Mr. Diaz. Your influence and the urgency of how garbage, trash, and waste are dangerously accumulating will undeniably motivate students and Filipino citizens to be fully aware of these problems, to take action, and to find ways to help solve or alleviate these issues. And now, thank you so much to our six prominent speakers for this webinar. We have learned a lot from you, sirs and madams. We will surely apply all these fundamental concepts in making our world a better and sustainable one. We would also like to extend our gratitude to Pinoy Basileta Corporation, Zero Waste Academy of Philippines, and Sustainable Energy and Enterprise Development for Communities for collaborating with us and making this event possible. I'd like to remind everyone to stay with us until the end of this webinar as a sign out and form and evaluation form will be available shortly. An e-certificate will be given for those who join and you can also acquire CS points. You will not be eligible to receive the CS points and the e-certificates unless you can complete the sign in, sign out and evaluation form. And now to show our gratitude to our guest speakers, we would like you to get, we would like to give you the Certificate of Appreciation. Allow me to read the Certificate of Appreciation. The University of San Carlos would like to present the Certificate of Appreciation to Mr. Enzo Favino for imparting valuable insights during the Zero Waste Living Management during COVID-19 pandemic webinar, given this 15th day of May, 2021. Signed by Engineer Philip Wong Marcon, the School of Engineering Community Extension Service Coordinator, 
Mr. Romeo Zoveta III, the Collegiate Engineering Council CS Committee Director, and Maria Nikamanapad, our, our Collegiate Engineering Council President. The University of San Carlos would like to present this Certificate of Appreciation to Mr. Bernard Lanes for imparting valuable insights during the Zero Waste Living Management during COVID-19 pandemic webinar. Given this 15th day of May 2021, signed by the School of Engineering Community Extension Services Coordinator, Engineer Philip Wong Marcon, the Collegiate Engineering Council CAS Committee Director, Romeo Zoleta III, and the Collegiate Engineering Council President, Maria Nika Manatan. We would also like to present the Certificate of Appreciation to Ma'am Sheila De Forest for importing your valuable insights during the Zero Waste Living Management during COVID-19 pandemic webinar, given this 15th day of May 2021. Signed by Engineer Marcon, the School of Engineering CES Coordinator, Mr. Romeo Zilweta, the CEC CS Committee Director, and Maria Nikamanata, the Collegiate Engineering Council President. We would like to once again present this Certificate of Appreciation to Madame Marie Lynn Ilanda Giliana for imparting valuable insights during the Zero Waste Living Management during COVID-19 pandemic webinar. Given this 15th day of May 2021, signed by the School of Engineering Community Extension Service Coordinator, Engineer Philip Wong Marcon, the, Coll the Collegiate Engineering Council CES Committee Director, Romeo Zulata III, and the Collegiate Engineering Council President, Ms. Maria Nika Manatat. This Certificate of Appreciation is hereby presented to Mr. Clarence Gio Almoite Al for importing his valuable insights during the Zero Waste Living Management during COVID-19 pandemic webinar, given this 15th day of May 2021. Signed by Engineer Philip Wong Marcon, the School of Engineering Community Extension Service Coordinator, or Collegiate Engineering Council, the Collegiate Engineering Council President. Now we'd like to present this other uh, certificate of appreciation to Mr. Dan Diaz for imparting valuable insights during the Zero Waste Living Management during COVID-19 pandemic webinar. Given this 15th day of May 2021, given signed by the School of Engineering Community Extension Service Coordinator, the Collegiate Engineering Council CS Committee Director, and the Collegiate Engineering Council President. All right, I hope that this talk will serve as an eye-opener to all of the importance of taking action to fight climate change. No, we still have the chance to save our planet, guys. So, Carolinians, I hope this webinar encourages all of us today to make better choices and to take action to make our ecosystem both sustainable and clean. Let us put into practice everything we have learned from our six distinguished speakers. Take small steps today. And we would never underestimate, underestimate the baby steps we're making in living a zero-waste lifestyle. As the famous quote of Tao Te Ching says, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You know, the process may seem to be too difficult or the goal is just too far away and there's too much work to be done. But the only way to achieve something really huge and ambitious is to constantly take one small step at a time. So let us save the world together by practicing the habits of the zero waste, which we've learned in this webinar. As this event is coming to an end, I would like to call on Engineer Philip Wong Marcon, our SOE CES coordinator, for the closing remarks. Hello, Wang Hapan. Uh, thank you for the College uh, Engineering Council for this uh, uh, Zero Waste um, webinar. And hoping that everybody who attended this would really understand and really 
felt the urgency of our problem now. This is not only local, but I think also global. And it's really in the hope that uh, with this learning we have just uh, absorbed, we can start individually that we should start generating zero waste. Maybe approaching zero waste, actually. It's like Six Sigma in industrial process. You cannot really have, can really achieve Six Sigma, but it is the continuing, uh, continuous process. It's a continuous process. So like us reducing our waste, it's a continuous process until such time that can, we can really avoid generating one. So let's focus on our target of helping uh, our planet Earth survive, no? So it has so much, uh, we have biodiversity issues, we have climate change, then now about waste generation, especially plastic. So expect some more action on our school of engineering, especially on our community extension to really support our advocacy in environmental sustainability. So this same, as you notice, we have so much um, education to prepare ourselves that once we go face to face, we will really go Action. Even now, we can do some action items which we are going to plan as we move on. So, again, thank you for joining us this afternoon and hoping that we will be really be conscious of the things we do with our ways. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Engineer Wong Marcon. Okay, then, so before we wrap of the program, we will now proceed to the documentation of this event. May we request everyone to please turn on their cameras if they can for a photo opportunity with our guest speakers. I'll give the floor to the tech team to do the honor. Kian Krita, um, you may take the floor. Please. All right, thank you so much everyone for participating in today's webinar. You may now switch off your cameras. Attention to all participants, please take a screenshot of this slide as this will be required for you to complete the sign out form moments from now. I'll give you 30 seconds to take a screenshot of this slide. Timer starts now. Okay, that's it. So for today's participants, you will also receive uh, these certificates of participation for joining us this afternoon.
I'd like to remind everyone that the sign-up form and evaluation form can now be accessed. The links are in the chat box for those who are in this Zoom meeting and in the comments section for those watching live on Facebook. On behalf of the School of Engineering and Collegiate Engineering Council, we want to extend our gratitude to our dearest speakers for importing your knowledge today. We would also like to extend our gratitude to the Pinoy Basurera Corporation, Zero Waste Academy Philippines, and Sustainable Energy and Enterprise Development for Communities, also known as the Safe Work Home, for collaborating with us and making this event possible. And this concludes our Earth Day webinar, Zero Waste Academy. This has been Lorenzo Igot IV, one of your hosts. And Maria Archel Vigiboni, your host. Now signing, now signing off. off. Thank you everyone for joining us. Stay safe and God bless.